Cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I guess I missed you. Yeah. I missed you too. I miss being here with you. That's always fun. Um, cool. So I hope you had a good class on Monday. You can tell me about it after. Um, and then I hope you watched the lecture because we're done with kind of basic types. And now we're going to go into more complex and interesting type inference. So specifically today, we're going to talk about a Hindley-Milner type inference, which is a essentially a much more advanced, or there's two ways to think about it. Either you can think about what you're doing is a smaller scaled down version of Hindley-Milner type inference, uh, or you can think of Hindley-Milner type inference as much more um, uh, expressive and does more things than what your project four is doing. But either way, they're related, so that's cool. Can we ask questions about the project? Mm, we'll save them for after. Okay. We can make sure we cover this. Questions on types? Type questions? Okay. So we looked at the type systems, right? So all the type systems that we've seen so far, how do we know the type of a variable? Everything we've looked at in the type systems that we've studied, how do we know the type of a variable? Given. What was that? Given. Who gives it? Me? Well, kind of, but yeah, the programmer, right? So exactly. So the programmer is explicitly declaring the types of the variables, right? They say, I want a variable foo, and it has this type bar, <coughs> right? So we've seen that with all kinds of examples. So we've seen examples of arrays where we give the range of the array and the elements of the array, what type they are. Uh, what, so, well, pop quiz. What kind of, a, what's the name of this type of A? In, in, in square brackets. The name of it? What, the name of the type of it? Uh, yeah, what's the name of the type of A? Let's think about this separately. So what is the type of A? Int. Int. Well, it's an array of ints. Right. Right. Declaring an A, the type is array of six elements of int, of integers. But what's the name of that type? Must be an integer, yeah. And that's the output of any index of an array. 
array of 0 through 5 of type int defined as or named A is the output of an int. So setting it equal to an int is correct. Right. So you have this array operator. Essentially, if you think about the type system returning something, right, returns this type <coughs> int. And so you're checking that this int here is the same as this type here, which is an int. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're saying, yes, that, that type checks. Cool. And so now we know, right, so if we have a different program where i is declared as a string type, right? If we were to do this, would this type check? No. No, why not? Because the index i is not, if the string isn't going to return something valid, most likely. Right, so the reason is the types, right? So the type of the bracket operator means that to do an array access, we access arrays based on their element, right? Not on strings. Yeah? If you switched i to a char, would it try and convert it to the uh, integer value of it, or would it just crash out? Depends on your language, I imagine. Uh, definitely depends on the language. Right here, we're talking a little bit more, not like concretely in C, but kind of more in this language we've been talking about, where the type system, we kind of, I mean, we want it to be very strict, right? So. Uh, you could actually maybe, so let's see, if you knew the range of the array, right, and you saw a character in here, if the range is bigger than a character, then you could say that that doesn't type check, right, because a character can't describe all possible indices. Um, so that would be interesting. That's what you can do when you know the size of every array. So you could do some cool tricks like that. <coughs> cool. Okay. So can we do something like this? Can we have our array of int a and int i and do ai equals the string testing? No. So why not? Because you're trying to load a type string into an array that contains ints. Exactly. So here we have, we have a string, so we're trying to set a string equal to the return of the array access operation, right? So in all these types, what's the return of the array, array access operation of a? for an int? In types. So don't think about memory locations. So int. just get rid of that. An int, right? It's the, it, what is inside of this array, right? Memory array access is giving us one of the elements of this array. So it's essentially <coughs> peeling back all that other types. So we're checking, the, is the int equal to a string? Well, no, of course not. OK, so at this point in your careers, I think you're familiar with some more expressive type systems than what we've seen here. Right, so what are parameterized types? What does that mean? Right, so in some language, so like generics in Java or templates in C++. Right, what does that actually allow you to do? So you can actually use, this allows you, so it's parameterized, right? So it's essentially like the type is a parameter to either a function or a class. So instead of defining a function on two integers, right, you can define a function on two types that are the same, right, which is actually more generic, and that means that function can be used in more scenarios, right? And it allows the programmer a lot more uh, abstraction and power in defining these more generic types of functions. Um, and so the idea is the type, weird. <laughs> uh, the type is given as a parameter to either the function or the class. So uh, Java and C Sharp both have generics, templates in C++ both do this. And so let's look at an example. So you can write a, a function in Java. So here we're going to create a static random variable. We're going to have a static <laughs> method called choose. 
that is going to take in two parameters, first or second. And the idea is this function will randomly return one of those values, either the first or the second. <coughs> right, so you can think of this, this is, I don't know, a handy function where if you just want to randomly choose one of these two elements, this function will allow you to do this. Right, so without parameterized types, you can only do this with, you would have to specify <coughs> the exact types of each of the arguments, right? You would have to say, first has to be an int and second has to be an int. But really, from what this function does, we just want it to return one of the two. We don't care what the types of those arguments are, right? We only want to just return one of them. And in fact, in this, the types are completely irrelevant, right? As long as they're the same, right? So why do they have to be the same? Because, because you're only outputting one. Exactly, we're only outputting one. So the function that calls us, right, needs to know the type of whatever we're returning so it can properly manage the types. Right, so if these were two different types, then we just return some random type and all type safety would go to heck. So we can do this very easily. We can have a little function that uh, calls random.next int. It gets an integer, it mods it with two. So mod two is gonna return either zero or one depending on if it's odd or even. And if it's zero, it'll return first. If it's one, it'll return second. Right, so now we have this generic method that we can apply to any types, any parameters. So we can, in our function, we can have variables x and y, right, which are integers. And then we can print out chooser.choose x or y. But didn't I say that the parameters here, to, the types have to be passed as parameters? So did I specify any of the types here? No. So how does, the, how does Java type check this? would look at the angle brackets, but since you didn't specify it, it probably would not work. So from the invocation of this function, right, did I, if I wanted to specify exactly the parameter of the type, could I do that? Yeah, I think you have brackets, I can't remember here or here. I think you had brackets here, I think. Yeah. Uh, you had brackets here to specify exactly which type you want to do. Or does, or does it know because both of them are of the same type, it just, exactly. it just figures it out. It can look here, right, and it can say, okay, I'm calling a parameterized function. Both the first parameter and the second parameter are of the same type, so are x and y of the same type? Yeah. Yeah. And what is that type? Int. So it knows to invoke this with pass using int as the argument. Yes. Is that true for all generic things in Java that they'll figure it'll figure it out if nope. it's no? Okay. Which is Figured. part of the problem. That's why it's not as smart. So we're building up. So we're gonna see that Hindley Milner is much more powerful than this. Um, but this is kind of what you can use in Java, which Java's kind of getting there. These other languages are getting there. So you have strings. So I can call the exact same method with strings, right? And Java has enough information at this function invocation to know exactly which type to Questions on that? Yeah. So it'll work for the string, but only if you're returning uh, an int. Ah, what am I returning? Sure. Hey, from, from the choose method, what type am I returning? You're returning an int. T. I'm returning a T. Whatever T. What is T? Whatever you pass it. Whatever is that parameter of this method, whatever the type of that parameter of this method is. Right, so in this invocation, this type parameter is int, so it's going to return an int. T is going to be an int. When we invoke it here, it's going to be a string, and it's going to return type string. Yeah. Will the return type ever be different than the parameter types? No, that's exactly what this constraint <laughs> here says. This constraint of this method says that the return type is always the same as the argument. So you can think about. Essentially, one way to think about it is every time this function is invoked, it, it looks and sees, well, not exactly why it's invoked even beforehand. <coughs> it can see that, okay, this is on int, so I know t is an int. So I can make a whole new copy of this method, replacing t with int everywhere, which is a regular Java function. And then with this, the same thing, I know here t is a string, so I can create the exact same thing, a brand new copy of this method, replacing all t's with strings. Yeah. So then that means the parameters have to be the same type also. Yes. They can never be different. And that's defined here. 
So you can, you can use generics to have as many types as you want. You can have T, U, V, whatever in this list. This defines the, the parameters. But where those are used, that defines the relation between the types. Cool. Okay, so you use this when you use like an array list or mm -hmm. yeah, this is exactly what's happening, right? So because an array list, right, or any kind of list, you don't really care what types you're putting in. It doesn't affect anything, right? But you want that class to be specialized on that type because you want to be able to put in, let's say, strings in one array list and ints in another array list. Not a great example because of the primitive <coughs> in Java, but the high level <coughs> is the same. Okay. So in this case, we have what's known as explicit polymorphism. So the idea is the programmer is declaring the parameterized types explicitly. Right? The parameter, the programmer is explicitly saying, here's a function, right? And here are the types to that function, right? It's going to take in a type T. In this example, so one type. So it's important that this is a little bit of different polymorphism than what you're used to thinking about in the object orientation, right? Here we're thinking kind of on functions and types so that I can use the same function in different places, just like with object polymorphism, right? I can use, I can call a parent class and depending on the specialization of that class, right, it may call a different method. <coughs> And so this is great because it allows, uh, you can call a function or a, you know, a class with different types while still checking type compatibility. So you still get all the guarantees of the type system. The type system will ensure that everything is still good. Um, but we go back here. We still had to say this type T, right? Just like just like in the previous things we've looked at, we have to explicitly <coughs> declare the types of variables here. But let's say if I got rid of this t and didn't put, specify any types of this function, could you come up with the types of, that this function should have, that the type constraints here? That each of the parameters have the same type and the return value has the same type? So let's think about that. Uh, and so this leads us into where we want to go, which is even more powerful and very cool, where we as the programmer don't even want to specify the type parameters. Right? So we want to be able to not even specify any of the type parameters, and we want the system to essentially infer the types that we want and create the program accordingly. So dynamic languages, right? We don't, do we have to specify, in a lot of dynamic languages, do we have to specify the types? So in Python or JavaScript or Ruby, do you have to specify the types of the variables? No. I think we talked about this a little bit before, right? But is that, do you think it's better or worse? Worse. 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 <laughs> it's more complicated for sure. I'm just worse. Um, yeah, it's, it, it can be worse in the sense that you don't know when you run the program if it's correctly typed or not. Right? It could be <coughs> add, trying to add strings with <coughs> lists or something. Right? Um, whereas with a compile time language like Java, you don't have that. But there, are, there can be a lot of cases where, have you ever tried to make changes to your program? Right? So like, oh man, I was using this string, but now I want to, instead of using a string, I want to change that with a struct or an object. right? So you have to go through at every place you use that variable and every single parameter, every single function, you need to change that to now use this new type, right? Otherwise, the compiler won't let you, won't let it work. Um, and the other nice thing about Java, I mean, some things about Python that are nice is you can, they use kind of what's known as, they call it like duck typing. So rather than, so basically the idea is uh, if it walks like a duck, swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, then it's a duck. What this means is I don't care about object hierarchy, parent, children, whatever. If I get an object and I call a function on that object, if it has that function, then I'm happy. Right? I don't break the type system. And if it takes the same parameters and everything. 
So and this is nice because you can write very generic functions. You can have a function that, um, let's say, sorts elements. And as long as it knows how to compare things and pass them to some kind of compare function, then it can properly do the sorting. Right? So in that sense, you can have functions that are a little bit more generic. But you have to give up the fact that you have this nice safety net of static type checking. So what's super cool about what we're learning is with implicit polymorphism and with Hindley-Milner type inference, you kind of get the best of both worlds. So the type system is going to actually statically check and verify that the types of your program are correct, while at the same time, the programmer does not have to specify any of the types. So the program is going to automatically try to infer the most general type for every single construct, function, function invocation, everything in the program, expression in the program. So if it can't solve this, if there are no types, types that solve this, then we'll say there's a type error. Otherwise, it will figure it out. And it's actually very nice because you as the programmer, you don't have to specify the types. You can trust the compiler to figure it out what you meant, that things are ints or strings. And then later on, if you want to change that, it makes it a lot easier. We'll also see it allows you to write functions that are a lot more general than what we're used to. Let's look at an example. So before I get started on this, right, this is a principles of programming languages class, right? Programming languages is one of those words, <laughs> or two of those four words, I guess. Um, right, so we're going to be, we've been talking about a lot of different kinds of programming languages. So here I'm going to introduce some kind of new, it's more of a functional programming language syntax. It should be fairly clear. I don't think it's, it's not meant to be tricky. It's just meant to be easy to look at and discuss because this is the way that a lot of um, uh, a lot of these languages that do implicit polymorphism how they look so it's just easier to kind of and we'll, we can talk about some of the differences there so for instance when we do have function definitions we're going to use fun because functions are fun right <laughs> so we're defining a function foo foo takes one parameter x and so what does foo return yeah, returns, it returns its first parameter, right, x. So that's the definition here. So foo x equals x. So now, what is the type of foo? So do we specify any types here? No. No. But <coughs> what can you tell me about the types here? Whatever x is type is. Because it has to return x. So whatever the type of x is, is what Right, okay, so let's talk about, think about this first. How many different types are there in this little function definition? Zero. Infinite. <laughs> How many things do we need to... <laughs> that's, that's a complete end of the spectrum there. Covering everything. It's actually negative infinity. So. <laughs> Damn. Uh, yeah. um, so how many things do we need to be able to say what the type is? Like, do we, okay, for instance, do we need to know the type of X? No. The program's going to statically determine that, right? It needs to determine types for every variable to do type checking, right? So the programmer doesn't have to specify, but the type system needs to figure out a type of x, right? What else does it need to figure out types of? What was that? Foo. foo. Yeah, we also have a function that we're defining, foo, right? So we also need to know the type of foo. And actually, one of the coolest things about programming in a language like this is you can actually, while you're programming, you can ask the type system what exactly is the type of x or foo. And it will tell you what it thinks the type is. And if it thinks it's something really weird, that means your program is wrong. <laughs> um, and so actually, oftentimes, so I've done some programming in OCaml, which is based on this. And it's crazy, because like, like you'll be fighting the type system. But then when your types all work, your program actually works. Because it's actually what you meant for it to do. So. So if we were to do a type of foo, what's the type of function foo? Using kind of the type syntax that we've talked about before. So what, what could we give the type of foo? Type of x. Right, so what is the type of x? Undefined. Anonymous. Is it undefined? Generic. Anonymous? Generic? Unspecified? Yeah, I think these are all the same things. We can say, basically say it's any type, right? Mm -hmm. So 
So we can just make up a new name for it, right? We can make up some name T, right? So we say it's some type T. So the type of X is some type T. So then what does that mean about the type of foo? It's T. Yeah. Like if, if X is type of T, then foo is type of T. But foo is a function. Is X a function? Foo returns a type of T. Exactly, right? So using, so foo is a function. And what do we know about types of functions? What do we have to say to specify the type of a function? Return type. Return type. Just return type? Input types. Input types? What's the word for that? Parameters. Parameters, yeah. So, so the types of the parameters and the return type, right? Exactly. So if we're to use this, foo is a function that what? Takes in what? Type T. Type T and returns what? Type T. Type T. And we can know this just by looking at that. So basically this means, right, whatever we invoke foo with as the type, whatever the type of the thing that we invoke foo as, the return type is going to be that same thing. Right? So if we call foo with a string, we're going to get back a string. If we call foo with a list, we're going to get back a list. If we call foo with a function that takes in another function that takes in another function that returns an int, <coughs> it's going to return that same thing. So it doesn't matter what we pass in we know that the type that gets returned is always the same thing. So we're also going to change our the way we write functions, uh, the types of functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to put all of the parameters of t in bracket, uh, the sorry, the types of the parameters <coughs> of a function in parentheses, right, separated by commas, and then we're going to have an arrow with the return type of t. So this means a function that takes in type t and returns type t. And this is just to, uh, we can keep doing it like this. This is a little more succinct, plus it uh, is exactly the format that most uh, languages that use this use. So it'll also help you if you use any of these languages. OK. So let's say we have some function foo x that returns x, right? So our same function above. And let's say we have another function bar y that returns foo of y. So now what's the type of bar and foo? Can we determine it? So what's the type of food? Does the type of food change? No. Right, so foo is a function of t that takes in one parameter type t and returns the parameter type t, right, which we're going to write as t, t. And what about bar? It's bar is a function of the type u that returns. Yeah, so we can, we actually, we actually reuse the same terminology because we're, what this means is that in this function bar, these types have to be the same, right? right? The input to t must be the output of t. But the relation between these two t's has no relation, right? They could just as easily be some other random value. OK. So, we got, so let's say we have a function max. So we're going to say if x is less than y, then if we're writing a correct max function, what should we return? y. Otherwise, x. x. Right? So, more things to notice about this function, this uh, language. We don't have explicit returns. Right? So we're not saying return y or return x. What we're actually doing is we're saying an if statement actually returns something implicitly. So. The result of a value, so an if is just an expression that if its condition is true, it will return whatever its true block uh, returns. Otherwise, it will return whatever its false block returns. All right. So now, what's the type of max? Or maybe put another way, do you have enough information to decide the type of max? Why not? I would say for this to work, x and y have to be the same type. 
Why? Because they have to be comparable. Well, they just have to be comparable. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's a couple things. So there's actually two separate issues here, right? So just like your homework, right, we have x less than y, I guess your project. Right? What does that mean about the types of x and y? They must be equal. They must be comparable. Or they must be the same type. Comparable, yeah, that's part of the problem, right? We actually don't know if they have to be the same type. It that's, kind of that's, depends on the language. language thing, yeah, but right. it really depends on what this, so is this less than operator? Can you think of that as a function? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if it's a function, what does it take in? What would its type be? T. Oh, Boolean. It's what does it take in? How many oh, parameters does it take in? It takes, it takes, it takes two parameters. Two parameters, let's say of the same type, T and T, yeah. right? And returns what? Boolean. A Boolean, exactly. So, but let's say this is a less than symbol that's only defined on integers, right? So it's int, int, boolean. So then what does that say about the types of x and y? They have to be, yeah, be ints. They have to be ints. Okay, let's think about this from another perspective. Let's say this was some random function. We don't really care. When we're thinking about, okay, when we first look at this, right, x and y could be arbitrarily different types, right? We don't have enough information to say that they're the same type or different types. But looking at this program, right, depending on which branch we go down, if we go down this branch, we return y. If we go down this branch, we're going to return x. So what does that tell us about the types of y and x? They have to be the same. They have to be the same, exactly. Right? So these types must be the same because they're used in two different if branches. right? So another way to think about this, if you have an if branch, Right? Each of the types of the branches must be the same. Because no matter which branch you go down, you might have to return the same thing. Yeah. So what about if you have like an int and a float in your program? I mean, you mean in the work? for the less than? <laughs> yeah, I mean like if you said, you know, five is greater than four point two. Yes, yeah, so it depends on the it depends on the specification. So uh, if we're assuming that the less than symbol is only defined on ints, then we're going to say that max is a function that takes in an integer and an integer and returns an integer. Right? There's nothing more general we can say about this. We can't say it's an arbitrarily type t because we see from the usage in the function of this less than symbol that they have to be ints. Right? This is the most general. And so the other way we'll write that is like int comma int arrow int. Okay. Let's change it a little bit. So but is this really general for the programmer? No. No, it's kind of crappy, right? Because it's only, we've written this, what should be this max function, but because we, the programmer, use this less than symbol, right? we are inherently forcing this function to only work on integers, which is what the less than symbol is. <coughs> so, now we have to start thinking a little bit more higher level. So. So what, really what we want, so do we want to specify, if we're writing a function for max, do we, the programmer who writes this function for max, do we want to specify the comparator operator? We just want to specify some kind of comparison function. Right, we want some logic to use a comparator function in order to decide which of the two values is larger, right? But this isn't very general. So why don't we let the programmer tell us what comparator function they want us to use? So how can we do that? By putting a comparator function in Yeah, <coughs> by using it as an argument, right? So let's extend oh. our function, right, to have the programmer pass in a function to be called. So for those of you that have used uh, vectors or sets, Right in your in C plus plus, you can tell it specifically what function to use to compare two elements of your set. Lists are the same way as well. Right. So this is extending that. So the idea here is functions are essentially what they call first class. Right. We can pass functions as arguments. We can return functions from functions. We can treat functions. Functions are not different from any other variable type. Right. They're just the same as strings or ints. Just that we can invoke them, right? We can call that function. <coughs> so now how would we rewrite that function that we just saw? If the comparator 
letters in the next line than at the start of the line elsewhere. Right. So, so now, what's the type of max? Type T. Does not. Or it's the secret. It's a function, right? So it's not going to just have one type. For, so it's. How many parameters is this type going to take in? Three. Three parameters? Each is of type T. The and return the type T. The, the type of max is the type of compare. Type of max is the type of compare? Well, no. That's not How many variables? So, okay, let's think about this. So there's a couple different layers in here, right? So, uh, so we know just from looking at this, the types of max and the types of compare can't be the same. Why? Compare A returns Boolean, but B, how many parameters does it take? Two. Two. Compare takes two parameters, max takes three parameters. Right? So max is a function that takes in as its first parameter a function that takes in how many parameters? Two. Two parameters and returns what? Boolean. A Boolean. What do we know about those two parameters? They have to be equal. Why do they have to be equal? Does anything about this function invocation here say that they have to be no, equal? Right. No. They don't right. have, they have to be comparable. Because they use they are they have to be the type of x and the type of y. Right. Right. Because the because the programmer specifies the comparison function somewhere down the chain. And exactly. But could let's look at this. Remember what I said about if statements? So what do we know about the types of y and the type of x? They have to be the same. They have to be the same. And they have to be the same as the return type of max. Which means that the types of the compare function must also be the same. Okay. Right? So this is actually a function of a function. right? Functions of t comma t, which returns Boolean, mm. and it takes in a t and a t and returns a t. So if we were to write this in our simplified format, right? <coughs> we have a function that takes in as its first argument a function, two types of that function, and returns a type t. CMP function used? Inside of max. Where inside max, specifically? In the if statement. In the condition of the if statement. So what do we know that the condition of an if statement has to return? Boolean. Boolean, right? I mean, that's kind of, we, I guess we didn't explicitly specify that, but we'll see that. But um, yeah, we need that to be a Boolean. So that's what we're saying is, if it wasn't used here, then there would be no constraint on the return type, right? The most general type would be some new type W that we haven't seen before. But because specifically of its usage right here, we know that it has to be a Boolean. And if the function usage, if we use compare somewhere else that's not, the return type of compare is not a Boolean, then we know we have a type error, right? So you can think of we, we treat everything as really generic types, and then based on the usage, we restrict them to more specific types. So now we can do cool things, right? Hmm. Now we have actually a very general function. We can call max and we can pass in the less than operator and then pass in 10 and 200, right? So we can call this function max with the less than operator. And we can also call it with the string compare function to compare strings, right? So let's, the less than function is a function that takes in two integers, right? And returns a Boolean which now means that this function invocation here, these must be integers, right? These t's must be the same. And then we know that this function invocation must return an integer. Here, we know string comp is a function that takes in two strings and returns a Boolean. So we know that the types of these two parameters must be as strings, and then the return type here must be a string. And we got all of this without specifying any types. Okay, look more. So we can have a lot of fun with this. This is why these are fun problems. So 
So now we have a function foo. How many parameters does it take in? Three. Three. And then it returns the result of calling C, passing in to C's first argument, the result of A bracket B. Right? So based on the usage here, what do we know about the types of A, B, and C, C at a high level? You don't have to get yeah. C would have to be a function. C is a function, yes. How many parameters? One. 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 <coughs> Good. What else? What about A? A, a is an array. A is an array. Mm -hmm. And so B is an int. And B must be an int. Right? We know from this usage, we can see here from this array access, B must be an int. Right? We can only access arrays with ints. This must B must be an int. We know, so there's other things implicitly that we know here. So we know that the return type of C is also going to be the return type of foo. Right? We know those have to be the same. We also know that whatever A is an array of, let's say it's an array of W's, that must be the same type that C accepts as its first parameter. Right? So we're going to have a function of, so A is going to be some array of type T, B is going to be an int, and then C is going to be a function that takes in a T and returns a U, some new type U, and foo returns U. So actually, even just from this type system, we can kind of see a little bit what's going on. We can see that, like, okay, we have some array of some type T's, we have some index into there, and we have a function to re translate from that type T to some new type, which is the return value here. So we have some way to, it's essentially translating, like C is translating from T's to. So does this mean that T and U can't be the same? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, exactly. They can be the same. Uh, it doesn't prevent that. Cool, so this is in our simpler format. new function. So now we say a is 10. So usually we're not going to do it like this with the statements. Um, but it should be very clear to read here. So a is a 10. We're calling a passing in b bracket c. So what's the type of foo here? So what's the type of, let's go in reverse order, what's the type of c? Int. Type of b? An array of, type An array of something. Type of a? Oh, I see. Yeah. A is a function that return that takes in an array of something and returns. Uh, so what does this function say that A is? What does this sorry function? What does this line say? What does this line say that A is? Function. A function. Can something be a function and an int? If you believe. If you believe hard enough, no. Type error. Oh. You cannot do that. <laughs> So Hindley Milner type checking is a general algorithm to do this for a program, to automatically infer what the types are at all points in the program and for all variables. Um, and this is amazing because you as the programmer don't have to specify any of the types. The type system will help you and decide the types for you. And the key idea is it, it leverages, it uses kind of like you can think of it as like base knowledge, right? It uses these, these things that we were doing, right? Uh, array access means that the argument to the array access returns some type i, and that means the array that you're accessing must be a type array. Uh, it uses function calls, so it knows that at function calls, the types have to be based on the invocation. It knows how many parameters need to be in that function. Um, and then it builds up on that, and it builds these together to try to infer the types. Uh, and if it can't, if it ever gets to a point where it tries to say, oh, an int is the same as a function, or an int is the same as a string, then it throws a type error. And so this full, the full Hindley Milner type checking is used in OCaml, F Sharp, Pascal, a lot of actually really cool languages uh, that are fun to play with. Okay, so the key idea here is you first need the type constraints of your language, right? If you have no constraints, then you're, everything always type checks, right? 
Um, so we ha first have constant integers, right? So we know what, what are the types of constant integers? Int. We're going to call them ints. They're going to be type int. Uh, constant real numbers. So when we have floating point numbers, what's the type of those? Real. Reals. Uh, we're going to have constant booleans. So we have true or false. This looks oddly familiar. <laughs> Almost like you're doing a homework assignment on this. Right, types boolean, and we have strings, right, where the types are strings. So constants, all the constants have specified types. We have our operators, so we have relational operators. So we have some operator, which has some type T1. I'm going to draw it in tree syntax, which is going to be uh, clear when we go through the algorithm. So we have our operator, and we have the first, the left side, which is A, the right side, which is B. Right, so the way we like to think about these is these are elements of the tree, of the parse tree. Right? We have our operator. It has a left child, which is another node. It has a right child, and it has all these types, T1, T2, T3. So our type con and operator in this case is all these different types of operators. So what we have here is we have constraints. Our type system is going to enforce constraints. So that it knows when it sees a relational operator, what does it know about <laughs> the types here from your project? T2 and T3 have to be equal, yes, what else? And type T1 is a boolean. Yeah, type T1 must be a boolean, type T and T3 must be equal, and you can also say maybe they have to be numeric types, or like in our language, you can just say they have to be the same type. All right, arithmetic operators, right, work very similarly. So we have plus, minus, multiply, divide. So the constraints could be that now here they all have to be the same type. Because when you add two numbers, two ints together, what do you get? Int. An int. Yes. Um, so we're saying that they're all the same, and then this constraint says that they have to be a numeric type, right? So this would restrict us even further <coughs> by saying maybe it can't be a string. We have our array access operator, right? On the left side, we have the array that's being accessed, and on the right side, we have the parameter that's inside that array access. So this would be A bracket B, we can see there. All right, so what does this tell us about the types T1, T2, and T3? T1 and T2 must be equal, T3 must be int. T1 and T2 must be equal? Couldn't it? Because if, because you have an array of whatever type. So you have an, an array of int. T2. What happens when you access an element of that array? What type gets returned? Returns an int. Returns an int. What's the type of A in that situation? An array of int. Yeah. So same thing as an int? It is not. <laughs> Very close, though. <laughs> so what is the relationship between T1 and T2? T2 is an array of type T1. Yes, exactly. So T2 right, must be an array of type T1. Right? So we know that A must be an array, and we know that whatever that array is composed of must be the same as whatever it returns. So then what do we know about T3 here? Yeah. Got to be an A. Okay, function application. So we're going to uh, use this to represent apply, so function applications. And on the leftmost, we're going to have the definition of the function, so it's going to be f. Then we're going to have all of the parameters of that function. Oh, so application. So this is not function definition. This is when we're calling a function. Right? So what does this tell us about the types here when we call this function? So what do we know about the constraints here? What does this tell us about f? f is the return type. f is? Uh, we're going to do the f is the type of variable foo. Oh. The return type is going to be r, okay. basically. Yeah. So what does this tell us about f? a function with types t through t0, I mean, not t0, yeah, t0 through t1. Yeah. t1 through tk? Yeah. What does it return? And it returns r. Yep. Oh. Oh, yeah, so f, right, f, this tells us that f must be some function, and it's a function that takes in these arguments, and it returns whatever type that that returns. 
Uh, we will stop here. We will finish this on Friday.